Well, as we've been going through the book of James, there is so much good teaching and practical wisdom for us to glean. That is all the scriptures, of course, but as God's providence has brought us, us being in this study of the time of the book of James, we are finding verse after verse after verse of very hard-hitting, very clear, very succinct teaching on what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and not just a general follower of Jesus, what it means to be a follower of Jesus in a local church body, and how we are to be committed to his local church. Um, as we've gone through chapter one, we see that the book in chapter one is sort of laid out all the themes that are going to be happening in the rest of the book. Uh, lots of things covering God's word, covering uh, the poor and rich and partiality and the tongue and how to take care of orphans and widows. There's all kinds of, of topics that have been introduced for us in chapter one. Chapter two, of which we just finished, primarily had to deal with partiality and how Christians are not supposed to be partial. We're supposed to treat people uh, justly and fairly. We're not supposed to give favoritism based on outward appearances. Um, that's not how God works. That's not how his people should work. We should treat people righteously and fairly. And the last two weeks, praise the Lord, uh, James spent talking through how it's important that our faith must be put on display to show true works in order to see if we're real, that there is such thing as false professors, false believers, people who think they're saved, people who say they're saved, but they're not actually saved. And James is saying, hey, you want to show that you're true and that you're real, your life has to back up what you say. That's just what it means to be a Christian. You can't play this double person game. And so that was faith without works is dead. That was the last thing we heard. As we enter into this new chapter, chapter three, it's going to be all about the tongue and all about speech, which is something that James has already brought up. That's what we're, we're seeing. He, he talks about a topic and he gives some teaching on it. And then later he'll revisit the same topic and give even more teaching on it. Give kind of like, kind of like a jewel. You can look at something through the same jewel, but you can notice many different aspects and aspects of it when you, when you turn it around and look at it from different angles. James is doing that with all these different topics. So for today, we're going to be starting the larger teaching on tongue, on the tongue, and it has many different aspects. We're only going to get into the first one today. <coughs> Excuse me. We're only getting into the first one today. In fact, our question, which is going to be true about the whole chapter, uh, but um, we'll ask it for today as we get into our first verse, is, is this, what must God's church understand about the power of the tongue? What must God's church understand about the power of the tongue? The whole chapter is related to the tongue and the need to control the tongue because the tongue ends up being a very important, although small part of the whole body, it ends up having an important, significant impact, either for the good or for the bad. Well, in today's passage, we're going to deal with one aspect of the power of the tongue, and in particular, in relationship to how teachers in the church should use their tongue, or how people in the church should not use their tongue. What must God's church understand about the power of the tongue? We're going to have two points for this morning. Our first one is this. You can write it down if it's helpful to you in your notes. What must God's church understand about the power of the tongue? The first is this. Church members must avoid wrongly desiring to become spiritual teachers. Church members must wrongly avoid desiring to become spiritual teachers. We're only getting one verse in, but there's plenty in this verse for us to talk about, and I submit to you today, this particular verse is a verse like many other verses in the scripture, but this particular verse, I'm convinced, is one of the verses that is just completely ignored in our day. People care way too much about what they think God says and God wants, and they spout off with much confidence 
and many words talking about what they think God says and what they think God wants and what God means. And yet they are disregarding the very words that God has said in his word to say, don't you be doing that. Don't you be talking or even wanting to be a teacher in the church. You don't understand how serious it is to be a teacher in the church. So let me read this verse. It's really just the first part of the first verse. Look what it says, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. I'll say it again. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Now, we'll point it out every time because it needs to be. Whenever he says, my brothers, this is reminding us that he's talking to local churches. He's not just talking to general Christians who can do or think whatever they want without a church family. When he says, my brothers, he's talking to the various different congregations who would have read this letter aloud to their congregation. When James sent out the letter, he didn't send it out to to specific Christians. He sent it out to churches. And those churches would read it out amongst their congregation with the elders, with the deacons, with the congregation, waiting to hear what James was teaching them through this letter. And so when he says, my brothers, he's, he's saying the, the group, the church, the gathered believers. Um, I, I stress this point because People so wrongly accuse James of not having theology and not having ecclesiology, and both are not true. James talks a lot about theology, theology of salvation, theology of God, theology of Christ, and he has a lot to say about ecclesiology, how the church is set up. He talks about teachers today is a clear example that there is an office or a role in which teachers play in the congregation. Um, And so it's important to point these things out and say, no, 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 this isn't just some general letter. It's very clear, very robust, and calls for us to have a higher level of theology and ecclesiology than we think. But what does he say? He's talking to a bunch of Christians who are in a local church who are listening to this, and he's telling them, not many of you should become teachers, (coughs) my brothers. (coughs) This is not the first time he's brought this up. If you remember in chapter 1, he said something very similar. Also verses that if you were with us are often misunderstood. James chapter 1 verse 19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers. See, he says it again. My beloved brothers, the congregation that's listening. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak. And he says, slow to anger. Many people know these verses, but they often think that it's talking about Christians generally or be uh, quick to hear generally, be slow to speak generally, slow to anger generally. No, we've already went over that he's not talking generally. He's talking specifically about slow to speak the word. Be quick to hear the word, meaning if you be quick to receive the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Don't be slow to hear it. Be quick to hear it. And do not be, be, but be slow to speak it. Don't think that you in and of yourself have the ability without training, without spiritual oversight to be able to just speak God's word without um, the, the proper training and the proper motive. He's telling you be slow to speak God's word. And how do we know he's talking about God's word? Because Verse 18 is talking about the implanted word of God, chapter, or verse 19, um, and then verse 20 and 21, 22, be doers of the word, not mere hearers only. So he's saying, he's already brought this up, be slow to speak God's word on God's behalf, because why? God's word is so important, and for you, for any of us, for myself, to be able to say something in the name of God, on behalf of God, and to mess it up, to say it too strongly or too weakly, to leave things out that should have been said, to add more than what should have not been said, is brings the anger and righteous wrath of God 
on false teachers. This is actually a very serious passage because look at what James is saying. He's warning the congregation. Hey, don't just think you can be a teacher. Don't just think you can be spouting off, talking confidently like you know what you're talking about when that may not be you. But we have to ask the question, <coughs> is James against teaching? Is he against uh, having teachers at all? Is it wrong to be a teacher? Is it wrong to want to be a teacher in the church? Well, no, there are some things we need to make sure we're hearing him rightly, that we're not overstating, we're not understating. What exactly is James wanting? I'll be looking to answer these questions. Is it wrong to be a teacher? Answer, no, it's not wrong to be a teacher. Um, in fact, let me show you that teacher, teachers are a, a, a necessary and even God-appointed part of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28 says, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Now notice, we don't have apostles and prophets anymore so because that was only for the first, for the first century. So what does that leave? The third teachers goes actually to the first place um, because apostles and prophets are gone. And so are these others here, miracles and gifts of healing, but helping and administrating various kinds of tongues. God has appointed these different roles in the church. Is it wrong to be a teacher? No, it's not wrong to be a teacher, of course. But um, uh, it's not wrong because God wants them. He has ordered for teachers to be in the church. Um, but it's wrong for people to want to be a teacher when they're not a teacher or to act as if they are a teacher when they're not a teacher, to teach with uh, or to speak with authority when they, not, when they have no authority. <clears throat> but it's not wrong to be a teacher. It's actually a good it's a good thing. Um, Romans 12 also talks about uh, those who are to teach should do it well. Uh, all, whatever the gifts that God has given to the church for the church, they should be done to the best of their ability. Romans 12, 5 says, So we, though many, are one, one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. God gives us these graces. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. There's nothing wrong with teaching or being a teacher in the church. It's not the office itself, but it's the persons who are trying to enter that office either inappropriately or maybe too quickly they're wanting the authority or the influence that comes with being a teacher in the church. And James is saying, hey, not everybody's supposed to have that role. Not everybody's supposed to be in that position. But again, is it wrong to teach? No. In fact, you might ask the question, is this passage only for teachers today? And the answer is <coughs> no. It's talking to the congregation about teaching and there are different ways to appropriately apply this text. Um, in some ways, most of all of us will have some form or measure of teaching in the church. Um, let me show you. Titus 2, well-known passage, talks about older and younger. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach... What is good? So here we, we show an example of older women. It's actually their role within the church to teach younger women what? To, to, and so train young women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. There are ways in which uh, many of all of us will have a form of teaching, a form of encouraging one another, um, helping each other, uh, training one another. So the act of teaching is not wrong. It shouldn't be avoided uh, in, in general. Well, um, James is going to talk about something specifically here. 
In fact, let me just uh, go over this generally. Who can teach? Parents can teach their children. Youngers or olders can teach the, the, the youngers, whether that's men to men or women to women. How about in the family? Siblings can teach. The older siblings can teach. The younger siblings. Um, church members can teach each other different things. This is all appropriate. But what James is talking about when he says not many of you should become teachers, he's talking about the office of teaching, that which really he's talking about not many of you should become and looking for the office teaching of elder. You shouldn't be looking to put yourself in a spiritual position of power or authority because only qualified, called, and tested men can teach and have authority in the church as a teacher of the church. And so James is talking about not people looking to place themselves into positions of power or positions of authority like the teacher is. Uh, that's what he's talking about. There's a specific application uh, today, which is don't seek after these things either inappropriately or too quickly or in the wrong way. And then there's a general understanding of, of today, which is no matter how we use our tongues, wherever we have influence, we should be careful about how we should use the tongue that God has given us. Um, but no, God loves teaching and God loves teachers. He's placed them in his church for, for their good. In fact, those teachers, elders who rule well are supposed to be honored and respected and celebrated and loved and appreciated because of their role that God has placed them in the church. 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those, he calls out, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. God does not, James does not hate teachers. In fact, it's his love for teaching and teachers that makes him want to guard the church and guard the office from false teachers, from immature teachers. In fact, this is one of the main ways that Satan has infiltrated the church, is through inappropriate, immature, illegitimate teachers and teaching in, in the local church. And he leads people astray through people who talk too confidently about things they don't know what they're talking about. And they get whole churches into trouble. The Bible even says leading whole families astray. This is a problem. This is a, this is a big problem. It's been, it was a problem in the Old Testament. It's a problem in Jesus' day. It's a problem in the first century church. It's been a problem ever since. There has not been a time since God has made the earth that there hasn't been the threat of false teaching. Isn't that exactly what Satan did in the garden? Is he came in and taught something different than what God taught. Teaching is so important. And so James understands this and wants us to understand this. <coughs> um, is it wrong to want to be a teacher? No, it's not wrong. 1 Timothy 3 says, this is a trustworthy saying. You could, try, you could take this to the bank. If anyone aspires, if they desire, to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. It's good to want to serve the Lord and to serve his church, and even specifically in this realm of, of being an officer of the church. But it is not good to demand it. It is not good to be impatient with the process of qualifying and testing. It is, it is not good to want it and saying, if you're not going to give it to me, I'm going to go find some other church who will. In fact, unfortunately, I know people who have left churches because they needed to have a teaching ministry. And, to, and all I have to say is shame on them. They were not willing to submit to what God had ordained in the local church. And they were impatient. And he said, I have a calling on my life. I'm supposed to be a teacher. Well, if you're supposed to be a teacher, God will confirm that through the local church. And he, it's not just your personal burning. That's such a problem these days. People think that whatever they are feeling or whatever they're wanting, it has to, must be from God. In fact, we were just watching this interview last night of a, of a country singer who wrote this song about 
the book of Revelation. You might, I don't know if you might have heard of it or seen it. But he talked about how God gave him this song that God like downloaded. He was a channel that God was giving him this song and he needs to write down these lyrics and he, he needs to make a video for this and he, he needs to be able to get it out. And, and the way that he was speaking, frankly, I was offended because he's saying as if God was giving him personal, private revelation directly to him outside of the scriptures. That's not how it works. God has already given us his word. Everything we need for life and godliness is in this book. There's nothing outside that we need. God has given us everything we need. And if we are to follow him according to his ways, we will find all that is necessary for life. Now, does that not mean that people can't be inspired? In fact, that's what I was thinking this whole time. Non-Christians get inspired to write songs too. Non-Christians feel like, I just had to write this lyric. I just had to write this melody. It was like something happening through me. It's called inspiration, meaning you feel strongly about something and you're so excited about it. Great. That happens to everybody all the time. That, that's not something that's common to man. But don't start attributing God as the source of those things when you're just, your mind was making rhymes or these word, word plays that were going on could happen from non-Christians. What's the difference between you and a non-Christian? Well, I know that I have a relationship with God. I know it was him. How do you know? Today's passage is going to say that God hates it when we attribute things to him that were not from him. God does not take it lightly when we say God told me this and it wasn't God. God hates that. And that happens all the time in Christian churches, in Christian families. People say, God told me, God told me, or I felt it. It was from God. I felt it. Am I saying that God doesn't lead or guide his people? Still, of course, God leads and guides his people through his word, through his already given word. Read it, believe it, obey it, study it, memorize it. He's got plenty to say. But so many people are looking for an extra word, a direct word, a private word. And then they're so quick to tell everyone, God told me, God told me, God told me, God told me. James would have nothing to do with that. Not many of you should be teachers, he says. Why? Because that's not how it works. The teacher is the one who is humbled underneath God's word, saying, I will only say what God wants me to say. No more no less. These are not my words to change or to add to. It's a very important passage. It's only one verse, but I mean it. I think so many people are disobeying this text. <coughs> what does Paul tell Timothy, an actually ordained teacher and preacher in the church? <coughs> Look what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, remind them of these things. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words. So many people care too much about words and how they sound. Don't quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Now he talks to Timothy. Do your best, Timothy, to present yourself to God as one approved. Meaning you have to be approved in order to be in this position. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, meaning it's possible for a teacher to be ashamed because he's teaching wrongly. He's adding his own thoughts, his own experience, his own personality into this. It's not about the teacher. It's about God. And he says, rightly handling the word of truth, not wrongly handling the word of truth, but avoid irreverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. See, there's a very serious warning and protection around the leaders of the church, particularly when it comes to the ministry of the word. Ministry of the word is something that must be guarded. It must not be given too lightly. <clears throat> so what is he saying when he says not many of you should be teachers? Is he saying it's wrong to be a teacher? No. Is he saying it wrong to, be, to want to be a teacher? No. He's saying wrong if you ever do any teaching in the church? No. What he's saying is 
there shouldn't be, not everybody should seek to be teachers. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 29 has this implicit in its questions. It says, are all apostles? Answer, no. Are all prophets? Answer, no. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. What's the implication of these negative, these questions with negative answers? The implication is, do what you're called to do in the church. Don't try to be something you're not supposed to be in the church. Be content with where God has placed you in the church to bless the church, but don't try to uh, chase after maybe somebody else's place or station. You, with, with the Lord's help, seek to maximize whatever it is he's called you to do. And guess what? The church will be helpful in affirming those things, in saying, brother, sister, you are, you've been so helpful in the way that you've um, visited these other, these other members or the way that you've been a blessing to our, our potluck ministry or the way that you've dealt with our, our children. We're so, thank you so much. Like, you are blessing us. Thank you for praying for me during the week. Thank you for texting me during the week. Thank you for bringing food and being thoughtful. Your ministry to this church, to me, to us, is a blessing. The, the church can affirm and see where God is blessing people. So what James is saying is don't seek for something that's not yours or maybe not yours yet. Be patient because it's very important. So this is what he's specifically saying. Don't chase after becoming spiritual teachers in the church. But I think there is something generally for, for us as well and I mentioned it before, it's, it's generally be careful how you use your tongue. Be careful how and when and how often you use your words because words are very important. <coughs> Several Proverbs back this up. Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 17, 27, and 28. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Proverbs 18. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Fools are the type who aren't trying to figure things out uh, carefully, humbly. Fools are the type who just say, oh, but I have to be able to get this out. Just let me finish what I'm trying to say. Uh, it really matters. You need to hear what I have to say right now. The Bible calls that person a fool because they just need to talk, 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 talk. No, that's not what we're called to be. We're not called to be fools. We're called to be wise. We're called to be careful. We're called to use our tongue. For, the, for righteousness. Proverbs 29, 20 says, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more help, more hope for a fool than for him. The Bible clearly calls for us to be very careful with how we use our words. Very careful. Um, we talk uh, on, today on the Lord's Day about how this day does not belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. It's actually his. And that's why you can profane the Sabbath when you, not, when you think or talk in ways that are not pleasing to the Lord. You just think that you have the freedom to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, this is generally true. Christians don't, do not have freedom of speech because we do not have freedom uh, from Christ. We don't have freedom of actions. We are slaves to Christ. Now, we have freedom in the sense that God has given us the ability to make choices. We have freedom in the sense that there are times that we can use our judgment, of course. But no, if we belong to Christ, everything in life or death is his. And we're supposed to present ourselves, our members, the members of our body, to righteousness. Therefore, if there's something unrighteous, there's something ingracious, there's something inappropriate, we should not be given over or given up to that. We should be, because of our love for the Lord, because of our gratitude of him saving us from the very sin that we're looking to step into in just moments, 
He saved us from that. We no longer need to be slaves of tongues that are out of control. We can be free in Christ. And so this is the standard of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Let me ask you the question for our section this morning. Are you spiritually hungry to learn God's word, but without being puffed up or impatient for God's design in the church? Are you spiritually hungry to learn God's word? Meaning, do you love God's word? Do you love it so much that you want to keep learning and keep growing and keep receiving? And it's true that when you love something, you often want to talk about it. It's true. You talk about your family, you talk about your job, you talk about whatever your heart desires. It often springs out of you. We should be talking about the word of God. We should be desiring to be sharing the word of God with people. But do you love God and his word? And do you want to grow in in understanding his word? Yet, knowing that there is an appropriate protection, an appropriate place in which people should speak and not should speak. People should be very careful about what they say, Because this is God's word here. And if we understand our Ten Commandments, our first commandment is about idolatry. Anything over God is idolatry. Second commandment is about our worship. We must only worship God according to the way he commands us. But third commandment is about blasphemy. Anything that is connected to God, his person, his word, his works, we treat it lightly. And so that's what he's saying here in James, is that we start talking about the word of God, as if it's light, even when we're excited, even in our enthusiasm, do we have a righteous reverence for God's word that that we're not looking to too quickly speak it out of turn? It's good good to examine ourselves this morning. Psalm 20, Psalm 139, actually, uh, verses 23 and 24 say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We should be humble and willing to have the Lord teach us and say, hey, I have much good for you, but are you willing to be patient with the place I've given you in my church? Are you willing to be very careful or are you not careful when you talk about my word? something we're called to do. How are God's church supposed to understand the power of the tongue? The first part is we are not to be seeking to become spiritual leaders and teachers in the church inappropriately, wrongly. What's our second point for this morning? Church members must avoid being judged for teaching falsely. Church members must avoid being judged for teaching falsely. So we must not seek to be, to wrongly be spiritual teachers in the church. And then James is going to give a big why, a because. Why should you be very careful about seeking to be in a teaching position in the church? It's because we're going to be judged with stricter judgment. So we should avoid this stricter judgment, judgment if it's not ours to have. Let's read again James 3 verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach, notice James includes himself, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. In fact, I think this is part of why James wrote this, is because he has a very clear understanding that he will be held to a higher judgment, a stricter level of judgment for what he's writing, for what he's saying. He was an elder in the church of Jerusalem. He was a pastor to many people, and he realized that with his influence and with his position comes responsibility and and accountability to God. So why should not everyone become teachers? Because not everyone's supposed to be judged that strictly. Only certain people are supposed to be judged that strictly because what God has called them to requires that strictness. In fact, is it not true? I mean, we see this... (coughs) We see teachers fall all the time. Hasn't there been more in, in the last few months? Teachers, unfortunately, longtime pastors. Uh, Tony Evans was a recent one who just fell in Texas. I mean, men after men after men falling. 
doing inappropriate things, saying inappropriate things. And guess what? When the teacher, when the preacher, when the leader falls, it affects the whole church. Does it not? It, their, their sin has greater impact. He's saying, don't sign up for that if that's not your calling, is what he's saying. Don't start acting like you're a teacher when you're not a teacher because you don't realize that you're bringing judgment on yourself. If you start speaking confidently about things that you don't know what you're talking about, don't, don't be doing that. This is actually a gracious protection. Not everyone's supposed to be teachers. Now, it's true that everyone's supposed to be godly. Everybody's supposed to be growing. Everybody's supposed to be love, love the Lord and love the word. And all church members are supposed to be like the Bereans, where they uh, individually, studiously go check the scriptures to make sure these things are true. So it's not taking away people's responsibility to know and love God and his word. What it is is saying, know how God has arranged the church and know and seek to fall in line with what God is doing and how God has set things up. Church members must avoid being judged for teaching falsely. <coughs> this is true for everyone. This is not just for teachers. You're going to be judged. I'm going to be judged on every single word that we say. Matthew 12 says, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. Jesus says this. So this is true for everyone, <coughs> every word, but there's a stricter judgment when it comes to the teacher's words. So don't don't be strict, more strictly judged when you, than you need to be. Limit your words. Be careful with what you're saying and how you're saying it. In fact, so there's the general Matthew 12 that says every word's going to be judged. But there's the specific, the one who teaches wrongly or leads people astray, they're going to get it worse. Look what, Matthew, look what Jesus says in Matthew 18. <clears throat> I'm sure you're familiar with it. Whoever receives one such child... In my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, Christians, to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. James must have understood the teaching of Jesus. It's better to be dead than to be a false teacher. This is what Jesus, this is not, this is not Jesus being over dramatic. This is Jesus rightly communicating the truth of how important it is to use your words rightly, particularly to not use your words to lead people astray. Anyone leads one of these little ones astray, they sh it's better for them to be executed, thrown over a cliff, drowned forever, no chance of coming up for air then it's for you to start spouting off like you know what you're talking about and you're leading some of these Christians astray. Can you just sense the how dare you? How dare you talk about things in a way that leads people astray? This is why we're only going over one verse because I think this verse needs to be rightly understood. I want to show that this is not just merely James it's not just merely Paul. This is not just merely Jesus or even a New Testament thing. This has been true from the beginning. God hates it when he is misrepresented. I want to give a few examples in the Old Testament because they're so clear. Jeremiah 14. God is judging his people for their stubborn hearts, for their idolatry, for their lack of following him. But look what he says when he calls out the false prophets and the false teachers amongst them. Jeremiah 14, starting in verse 13, says this. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, these are the prophets saying, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. These are false prophets giving false hope 
Oh, you're not going to see the sword. You're not going to see famine. Everything's going to be fine, uh, Israel, when they should have been very scared of God's anger and wrath, and they should have been repenting quickly. But what were these false prophets saying? Everything's fine. You're fine. Don't worry about it. God's going to give you peace. False sense of security. Verse 14, and the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them. Notice, there are prophets and teachers who send themselves, but they, qu- they claim the authority of God on their life. God told me this. God, I know it for sure. God told me this. No, they sent themselves, and God is calling it out. The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and a deceit of their own minds. Is it really that bad? I mean, all they're saying is, yeah, you're going to have times of peace. It's not going to be that bad. Is that really such a terrible message, God? Apparently, God is saying, I'm bringing judgment on you, and you're telling them that they're fine. How dare you? I have a message of you must repent. You must follow me with everything you have. Do it now. I'll forgive you if you do. But these false prophets stand up, and they talk to the people, and they say, ah, it'll be fine. It's not a big deal. Sin's not such a big deal. (coughs) And God says that it's worthless. It's divination. It's deceit, and it's their own minds talking. It's not God. (coughs) Verse 15, thus, therefore, says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say, sword and famine shall not come upon this land. What is he going to say next? God says, by sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. The very thing that they say is not going to happen, I'm going to do the exact same thing to them. They say there's no famine, there's no sword. They're going to get famine and sword for trying to lead my people astray. (coughs) Verse 16, and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem, victims of famine and sword with none to bury them. Them, their wives, their sons, their daughters, I will pour out their evil upon them. You know what he's saying? I'm going to judge these false prophets and everyone who listened to them. It's not just merely saying the wrong words in the, in the wrong authority. It's participating with it by saying, yeah, that sounds good too. <coughs> Can we see the seriousness with which false teaching, false prophesying, claiming God's name and his power wrongly on how angry that gets God. This is not the only example. Ezekiel is another one. I mean, they're all over, but I'll just show these these two. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse one. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against those prophets of Israel who are prophesying And say to those who prophesy with their own hearts, noticing it's not his word, it's their own hearts, hear the word of the Lord is what they're saying. Thus says the Lord God. This is, notice they're they're claiming God. Hear the word of the Lord, what I'm about to tell you. This is what God has to tell you. They're claiming his authority. (coughs) But he says, thus says the Lord, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Oh, you think you've seen something? You haven't seen anything. <clears throat> Your prophets have been like jackals among ruins, O Israel. Verse 6, they have seen false visions and lying divinations. They say, declares the Lord, when the Lord has not sent them, and yet they expect him to fulfill their word? Have you not seen a false... You have... Uh, have you not seen a false vision and a uttered a lying divination whenever you have said, declares the Lord, although I have not spoken? <laughs> Verse 8, therefore, he says, thus says the Lord God, because you have uttered falsehood and seen lying visions, therefore, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and give lying divinations. They shall not be in the council of, of my people nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord. I don't think I have to prove this anymore. 
God hates it when people speak falsely in his name, lead other people astray. He comes with judgment on them, strict, full judgment on them and anybody who listens to them. False teaching is abominable to God. The teaching that God desires and designs in his church is not to be false, but to be his life-giving word, his word that does bring truth, does bring hope, does bring help. But when you hear false words, it leads you astray from God, not towards him. God has ordained that the preaching and the teaching function of the church, the ministry of the word, is to be healing to your bones, is to, is to lift up your souls into the heavenlies so that you can truly know and see God through the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> First Thessalonians makes it clear. This is what's true when the word of God is rightly taught and preached. First Thessalonians 2 says, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word, that means you Christians out there, you, you members, you're supposed to receive the word. Look what it says, which you heard from us, the apostles, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but at what it, what it is, really. It's the word of God, which is at work in you believers. When God speaks through his teachers, it's supposed to be God's word working in and through you. So for somebody to hijack that process, for somebody to taint that process is terrible. It's terrible. This is why we must have good and right teachers, preachers, officers in the church. We must guard this office, guard this work. It's not the only thing in the church. Hear me say that. Teaching is not the only thing in the church. There are many different ways that the church operates. But this particular, this particular ministry of teaching is so important and foundational to the life of a church that it must be guarded just like James is guarding it here. <coughs> Paul tells Timothy, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine in order to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. I want to give two more examples before we, we move forward. Second Peter First chapter 2 says this, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. <clears throat> By the way, those who are here during Sunday school already heard this, but for the rest of you who, didn't, who missed Sunday school, there has been a, a woman who's come to our church uh, who we are banning from our meeting. Her name's Jenny because she's a part of a cult, and she's a part of a cult that denies the divinity of Jesus Christ. They think that there's another Messiah living on earth now and that their leader is the Messiah. They call him the second king. And this cult is all about Christians taking up arms, literal guns, and shooting against the enemies of God so that they can take the kingdom of, of heaven by, or kingdom of earth by force. It's literally a violent cult. She came in here, dropped off information, came back. We talked to her and said, no, you, you can't believe that. You're in a cult. Repent, recant from this. We're telling you, she's not allowed. False teachers are not allowed amongst us. That's not loving for us to allow somebody because we think we're being Christian nice to say, um, oh yeah, we want everyone to hear the truth. Well, maybe they'll hear the truth from us. Yeah, how about when we do tell them the truth and they reject it? What about when they do tell them the truth and they say, no, our way is better. We want you to, to follow this other false God. You don't play nice with wolves. You shoot them. You kill wolves. Otherwise, you endanger the sheep. We're just trying to take the, the preaching and the teaching ministry, the way that the scriptures talk about them, and apply them accordingly. Now, obviously, if this person were to be willing to repent and to believe the truth, of course we would have the, the, them among us, and we would preach the gospel, and we would be patient. But if they're playing games with us, wolves can lie. Wolves can, can lie so that they can get in and then take advantage. We're not stupid. The, and, the, and, the church, and the church is not supposed to be uh, careless about this sort of a thing. 
False teaching is unacceptable, inappropriate, and so we will not have any of it. Just like Peter and Paul and Timothy and all these people are saying, just as there will be false teachers among you, he says, who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. The last one, Jude 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about the common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, fight, to contend for the faith that was once delivered to, to the saints, meaning there is, there is a, a body of truth that was handed down from Jesus to the apostles, to us, and that body of teaching must be guarded. And so you must contend for it. And so what did he say? For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for their condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God's word is clear. We must be very careful to not want inappropriately uh, a teaching office that is not meant to be ours. Or because if we do, we are subjecting ourselves to a very strict judgment of God. So let me ask you this. How often do you pray for self-control in the use of your words? And how often do you pray that the ministry of the word at this church would stay faithful? How often do you pray for your own words to be underneath the humble self-control of the spirit of God so that you're not saying things in a way that would blaspheme God, in a way that would lead others astray? <coughs> Is that a regular prayer for you? But not just for yourself, for the church. Are you praying weekly for the church? Lord, grow us in our truth. Grow us in our understanding of how to rightly know the Lord, worship the Lord, how to rightly love Jesus, how to rightly serve our neighbors, and not speaking out of our own thoughts, out of our own opinions, which don't matter. What matters is God, what he says, what he wants. Is that a regular part of your prayer? Well, I would like to encourage you now because I'm sure many of you, if you're listening, have, have been challenged by the word of God and, and the Holy Spirit can and does work in our lives to even bring things to mind of, boy, I've been not, I haven't been careful. Oh, maybe I have some, some pride in my heart. I've wanted something too soon or I've spoken too quickly. This is true. I hope the Holy Spirit's revealing this to you. But let me also encourage you, praise the Lord that our salvation, if you are in Christ this morning, is not based on your own righteousness. Your, your salvation is based on the righteousness of Christ, on his perfection, on his use of his tongue. In fact, just think of Jesus. He never said the wrong thing. He always said the right thing in the right way at the right time. He didn't use too many words. He didn't use too few words. He didn't uh, not speak up when he should have. He didn't say something when he shouldn't have. He only said the exact right words all the time, filled with truth and grace. We place our faith not in ourselves. We place our faith in him, in him alone, his righteousness, his work, his death on the cross, his teaching. And we believe in him and him alone. In fact, Jesus' own words say this in John 12. For I did not speak my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. And I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So if you're here this morning, be encouraged, be reminded, Christ is your only salvation. Place yourself again at his feet, not because you're getting saved again, because you're being reminded, oh, I need Christ. I need his love. I need his perfection. I need his righteousness. I need his strength to be able to guard my tongue, to love my family, to love the church, to serve the world, but not in my own strength, in the strength of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. You're so good to us to give us the truth. You're so good to us to give us churches and teachers and 
Lord, to correct us when we're wrong and to encourage us to go the right way. Lord, to, to keep us humble. Lord, I do pray that you would help the words that come out of our mouth from people of Disciple Church, that they would be truthful words seasoned with grace, the right word in season. Lord, it wouldn't be too many words or too little words. It would be just what you've called us to say. Why? Because we love you so much. We want to be pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would be a blessing, a beacon of hope and truth because we bring the words of Jesus. And so, Lord, encourage us, strengthen us, keep us on the straight and narrow. And all, the, all your other churches, Lord, we know we're, we're one of many churches, Lord, that you're doing incredible work through. So, Lord, please continue to do that work. Keep us humble and keep us on the straight and narrow. It's in Jesus Christ that we pray today. Amen. Amen.